Good afternoon. Um, I'll be talking um, about similar challenges uh, to those that we've seen so far, but in this time, in the case of extending the life of bridges, uh, which is the particular area that I work in, I have worked in for some years. Um, I'll start with a brief introduction uh, to me and then um, move into exploring the subject, uh, looking at the challenges in a number of areas. Um, first of all, have we, as we've heard before, where it sits in the context of the environmental challenge that we face. Um, secondly, looking at some of the innovation challenges that extending the life of bridges pose uh, with a couple of case studies. Um, then I'll have a look at the business case challenge um, and then look at the skills challenge that we face in, in rising to this uh, overall need. Um, so my name is Joe Bonnet. Um, uh, my current job title is Vice President for Covey in the UK, which means I'm um, overseeing the operational side of the business um, in the south, um, so primarily London and Bristol. Um, I, I'm from a background of being a specialist in existing bridges, and a few of my key projects are the Hammersmith flyover, where I led the Czech um, Gade Valley Viaduct, which you see on the screen there, um, Erskine Bridge near Glasgow um, and, and the Humber Bridge, which I'm sure everyone will have heard of near Hull. So for first of all, starting off with the environmental challenges, um, our network, our road and rail network is clearly aging. Um, many of our structures are decades, if not uh, centuries old. Um, the, the first slide you saw was a picture of the Clifton Suspension Bridge because I live near Bristol. Um, many components uh, need replacement and we also need to look after the fabric of, of these aging structures. Um, the construction of new projects and new routes um, are really being challenged now uh, for their compatibility with the drive to zero carbon. A lot of people will have uh, seen the announcements um, from the Welsh Government um, that they won't be initiating any new road schemes until they can establish how they fit within the drive to zero carbon and the roadmap to zero carbon. We really must optimise the use of the existing very extensive infrastructure that we've already got built and make it fit for the future. Also, the demands on our infrastructure evolve as society changes. So just like our demands for building spaces evolve and change over time and the buildings need to adapt, so too our, our transportation infrastructure um, must adapt to changing society, um, changing travelling patterns um, and, and similar. And finally, um, bridges like buildings form part of our heritage. Um, so the the building, uh, the bridge at the bottom there is the Erskine Bridge um, in Scotland, and that's now listed. A number of our major bridge structures um, are listed. So not only the obvious ones like Clifton Suspension Bridge, um, but also bridges like Humber. Um, so um, it's really important that we keep, keep that heritage alive by keeping those uh, live working structures um, and not monuments to the past. The scale of the challenge really is enormous in terms of thinking about our aging infrastructure. Um, Highways England have about 20,000 bridges uh, in the portfolio, I believe, and um, they currently budget for replacing perhaps 100 or hundreds of bearings a year. Now that that's probably out of at least 50,000 bearings, uh, probably more, more like 100,000 bearings that exist. So we really can't, um, we have to find different ways to keep up with the maintenance that's needed to ensure um, safety and um, sustainability of our structures. Moving on to the innovation challenges that this issue poses. The first thing I'd like to say is that I think it's really exciting because constraint drives innovation. Um, without constraint to our designs, uh, it doesn't force us to think differently. So um, it's a really exciting 
area to be in because you always have to think of new ways to do things. Um, it's an opportunity for the industry. Um, the design of new structures is becoming increasingly automated, um, but that's much more difficult to apply in the case of existing structures of, of unknown condition. So it's a real um, opportunity for, you, for us to use our skills. There are a few key areas of innovation um, that need to be tackled. The first is about determining what we have. So there are often hidden defects within structures. Um, you know, very uh, famously the um, Morandi Bridge, um, which tragically um, collapsed. Um, those, those were defects hidden within uh, the concrete encasement, the cables, is the, is the current belief. And um, there are all sorts of different hidden defects that can exist within structures. In some cases necessary to determine the as-built geometry because that geometry wasn't uh, what was intended and, and can be significant to the performance of the structure. Um, there's a case study I'll cover later where that's the case. And we also need to understand the materials that we're dealing with. Um, even if we understand the age and specification, original specification of the materials, quite often the actual materials differ from that. Um, for example, the, the, the yield stress of steel often is higher than the nominal yield stress that's specified. Um, and quite often concrete um, can strengthen over, over a longer period of time, so maybe, maybe stronger than we um, had intended at construction. Second thing is we need to understand how that structure is performing. Structural health monitoring can be really important in that area, um, but also we need to uh, work out how to integrate monitoring and analysis um, so that we get a really accurate picture, not of how the structure was intended to behave, but how it actually is behaving and how it is performing. And a third area is around extending life and the innovation that we can have in that area. One of the key areas is in minimising disruption. Um, so we need to um, look at in situ improvements um, so that we can keep the, the structure active. We're now uh, going to look at a few of the innovation challenges in a little bit more detail. So the first area that's really important is component replacement. Um, bridges, despite being nominally static structures, um, actually move. They move significantly in some cases under live loading. Um, they also almost inevitably move under thermal loading because they're typically long structures. So in order to accommodate that, um, we have bearings and we have movement joints. And those inevitably have a lifetime significantly shorter than the structure itself. Um, quite often the nominal service life of those components is 20 to 40 years. Um, we also have things like stays and hangers on suspended structures um, that may need replacement. Um, or there used to be a problem with the fatigue of hangers, particularly in those structures built with diagonal hangers. Um, and the top photo is um, a picture of a hangar being replaced on the Humber suspension bridge. In that case, it was uh, to replace a hangar in order to do testing and investigation on the condition of the hangar um, to inform future maintenance. And there are also post-tensioning uh, systems and post-tensioning bars that may need replacement over time um, due to corrosion, inadequate um, protection. Um, the low picture that you can see there um, is the rather shocking condition in, in one area of the post-tensioning tendons on the Hammersmith flyover far prior to strengthening in 2012, which led to the emergency strengthening works at that time. It's often very com complex to replace these elements under traffic loading um, and Quite often when these structures were built, um, the, the traffic levels were significantly lower and therefore there wasn't proper provision for replacement of elements under traffic loading because it was assumed that you could carry out closures in order to do that maintenance. Um, but the stress on the structure on the network as it is now in this country and elsewhere is very substantial 
and closure really isn't deemed acceptable anymore, except in extreme cases. The other thing we need to grapple with is functional versus visual condition. I mean, it's, it's obvious in the case of the pictures of the corroded tendons at the bottom there that, that there's a significant problem with a functional condition and not just the vi visual condition. Um, but in the case of some elements like bearings, it can be quite difficult to distinguish between poor superficial visual condition, so surface corrosion on the outside of the bearing um, versus functional condition, which is whether it actually articulates in the way that we need it to and how much resistance there is to articulation. The reality is we can't afford um, to replace all those components on a nominal life basis. Um, it's simply not budgeted for and we shouldn't do it for sustainability reasons where it's not necessary. And the other area is we can't afford to close routes um, for extended periods to carry out that work. So we need to think about clever ways to achieve um, continued use of the structure um, without those things. The third area of innovation challenge really is around condition deterioration. Um, and that includes steel fatigue, um, but also concrete degradation, um, so particularly chloride ingress and uh, carbonisation, um, deterioration of waterproofing and surfacing, um, which not only affects the use of the structure, but also the liberty uh, of the waterproofing that's being protected, the structure that's being protected, and also corrosion protection. Um, Painting sounds, uh, sounds like a trivial exercise um, and only think of some of the access uh, constraints that we have on our existing structures, um, either due to working over water or particularly working um, over live railways. The other area to extend the life of our bridges um, is to make them fit for the future. So that's around improving the capacity of those structures to meet future demands. So it may be a case of adding additional lanes um, or additional tracks in the case of railway structures. It may be about increasing the load capacity, um, the range of vehicles that you can use the structure, or it may be about safety improvements. Um, so one area that we've been involved with um, quite a lot recently is around um, public safety barriers. Um, so that's uh, really addressing uh, some of the tragic instance we have in terms of people taking their own life on, on structures um, and the improvements that can be made there. Uh, the first brief case study um, that I'll cover is, is around bearing replacement. Uh, just uh, it, it was a fairly simple one, but it's, uh, it's indicative of, of a huge um, kind of backlog of maintenance across the network. The first step is around investigation. Um, so the most simple starting point is, is visual inspection, um, but then also various forms of monitoring. And one of the ones that we've been using uh, recently on structures is around looking at just simply time, map, time lapse imagery um, to look at how much bearings are moving, moving and therefore determining that functional condition in terms of articulation. Um, we can also look at surveys to assess um, what the knock-on of uh, reduced articulation is. So for example, on peer movement and other mechanisms where, where the strain associated with thermal movements is being taken. And that can be used to prioritize intervention. Uh, looking specifically um, at one case where we're looking at the QE2 bridge um, at Dartford, so that's the M25 uh, carrying the, the link to the M25 on the eastern side. Um, just on the viaducts alone, there are 215 bearings. Um, a lot of them were suffering from worn sliding surfaces, and in some cases those were um, so worn um, that there was a possibility of failure through that degradation. Standards for bearings have moved on since construction um, and the existing pot bearings were not deemed to be compliant with modern standards, the EN 1337, 
Um, so it wasn't possible to make a like for like replacement. And given the fact that those bearings were wearing quite badly, it was also um, an improvement was needed um, to reduce the number of future replacements that would need to be carried out. Um, in this case, the new bearing sliding plates were grouted into place and therefore there needed to be long setting times in order to fit new bearings. The standard approach would require an extended road closure um, because it wasn't possible to run traffic over the jacking points. So the key issues were uh, a limited duration closure, the need to enable articulation under traffic, uh, low clearance, and the limited capacity of the jacking points. Um, so the need to make that articulation effective um, to minimize the additional loading on the jacking points. So the solution was to install temporary bearings. Um, after the, the load was removed uh, onto the jacks um, and then to allow the structure to reopen on those temporary bearings um, with some articulation um, while the new bearing was installed and set in place. So this allowed the, the bridge to um, open to full traffic loading. Um, the new bearings were compliant, which allowed a certain amount of rotation and articulations to um, share the load um, because they were dispersed in terms of the longitudinal axis of the bridge. And so under rotation, they pick up more or less load. Um, it increased the cost of the temporary works, um, but there weren't any extended closures and that led to a substantial road usage charge savings, um, which effectively um, made the project more cost effective despite the additional temporary works. The second uh, brief case study is around the Gade Valley Viaduct, and that is um, a structure carrying the M25 again, um, and uh, this time in the northern section of the M25, um, near the junction with the A41. Um, this is a box structure um, that was built, it was actually the final link in the M25 um, when it was constructed, um, uh, so in about 1990. Um, the box structure in some areas, the, the bottom tension flange has very large unstiffened panels of um, down to eight millimeters plate thickness. Um, when it was constructed, uh, that led to some uh, weld shrinkage causing deformation in the panels. And then under the action of traffic load, those panels flatten out, effectively kind of breathe up and down, and it leads to a substantial fatigue shortfall at the welds. As these are transverse welds right across the bottom flange, um, any fatigue failure um, in those welds is potentially catastrophic for the structure and therefore they're highly critical. So we went through a staged assessment. First of all, um, assessing standard detail in accordance with the simplified rules in the code, which showed this detail to be acceptable, um, but a detailed assessment uh, based on measured panel dimensions and distortions showed very short lives. We then calibrated that theoretical modeling um, against real behavior um, and then moved to a fracture mechanics approach to determine the safe interval for safety. Obviously the key issue being ensuring safety of that major road um, under very heavy traffic loading um, in the intervening period while a long-term solution uh, was established. And then we used advanced assessment using strain gauge monitoring as well to really refine the assessment and target the intervention that was needed. This, uh, this issue was really solved through a combination of innovations. So the first was around fatigue assessment using measured stress cycles. Um, we also used laser scanning to build up the as-built geometry of those panels and to feed that into the assessment. We also used um, a mock-up to refine the intervention approach and particularly to, to deal with that down on the ground so that those approaches could be um, refined and really made efficient when we moved into the confined space of the box girder 
um, high above the ground. And then finally, um, one approach taken to um, lengthening the life of those welds and resetting fatigue damage that's known to have um, taken place in the past in combination with other stiffening measures um, was plasma dressing. Now that is to our knowledge, the most extensive use of plasma dressing um, that's taken place on a live structure. And there was a lot of work to verify that approach um, for, for use on, a, on an open structure. Ultimately, there are huge benefits to be had from innovative solutions to these existing structure problems. Um, in this case, um, the use of the extensive um, strain gauging um, was estimated to save about three million pounds in strengthening costs. Um, and most importantly, it allowed that the various approaches allowed it us to keep that structure open and thereby call, allow 165,000 vehicles to continue crossing that structure every day. Um, the, the benefits can really only be realized um, through a number of kind of contributory factors. And so looking back on some of the projects I've been involved in, I think the key features of these innovative solutions um, are an engaged client who's really interested in finding the best solution for their structure um, and the best um, way of implementing that. The next thing that you need is time. You need time for testing, but you also need time for approval and any departures from standard to be able to implement a different way of doing things. Testing is absolutely key to verify um, proposed solutions and particularly testing and working on mock-ups um, to refine those solutions. Often uh, those solutions need to be applied hundreds if not thousands of places across the structure uh, and therefore refining that approach creates certainty for everyone and allows that to be implementing safely. And the final thing is collaboration across the supply chain. As an example, the plasma dressing solution uh, required working with the equipment manufacturer. It required working with the steelwork subcontractor um, the main contractor and us as designers all working closely together um, in order to develop that, that solution for the structure. Moving on to the business case challenges. We really need to make the business case um, for reusing existing structures and extending their life based on a whole life cost approach. Um, that's driven by most major um, structure owners now um, and, and really helps to balance the whole life cost against short term interventions and to improve the planning of interventions on existing structures. Advanced assessment costs money. Um, we really need to invest in that advanced assessment to save on the project overall. If you skimp on the uh, assess a fee at the beginning, you're going to end up with a very um, heavy intervention um, because refined assessment takes time. We need to prove the benefits of innovative solutions and increase certainty through trials. So we need to make the case for those trials and tests um, to prove those benefits. The monitoring that was carried out on Gade Valley, the extensive strain gauge monitoring, that was carried out one span first. Um, we proved the benefits in terms of strengthening savings. We then carried it out to a second span, um, proved again that there were gonna be benefits before it was rolled out to all 11 spans. So taking that, that stepwise approach can bring the client along and, and show the benefits. We need to look at costing the disruption and the carbon into our consideration of adaptation and strengthening. So in a similar way, uh, Steve was saying about um, making sure the benefits are clear on retaining buildings. We also need to bring that into the assessment of what to do about structures, uh, bridge structures. 
one key area which I think is going to be addressed by one of the later presenters is uh, determining what we do about uncertainty and liability for existing structure, condition and hidden defects. Um, it's very difficult, you never get complete certainty on an existing structure. Um, even structures built relatively recently often have missing parts in their, um, in their records. And so there is always some uncertainty and that liability needs to sit somewhere and it needs to be clear where it's sitting and people need to accept and understand where that sits. And finally, we need to uh, understand the politics and sell the benefits of reuse um, over the kind of shiny, shiny solution of a new structure. Uh, I'm almost uh, at the end of my presentation. Um, the, the final challenge I'm looking at is skills challenges. It's certainly not the glamorous end of the profession, um, particularly the inspection side of things. You can see there's some pretty difficult positions that you have to get into to find out what's happening in the structure. Um, that's a picture inside Hammersmith flyover and the side cells, I think. Um, however, it can be fascinating um, and, and a really satisfying place to work. Um, we need to keep teaching the fundamentals um, because we need people who are confident to operate outside the code, um, understand the risks associated with that and, and make the arguments where there's um, benefits. We need the skills to be able to diagnose and understand our structure, not how we want it to work, but how it is working um, and, and how it could be working. And then we also need that understanding of the client and financial drivers. So particularly around the financial models that they're working with uh, and what the societal drivers are um, that are behind those. Um, one of my colleagues, I was, I was telling them I was going to do this presentation and unprompted, he, he said um, that he really values the satisfaction of doing work that basically nobody knows takes place. But when you tell them about it, they suddenly find it really interesting. Um, he has a, a particular enjoyment of uh, uh, walking around under structures uh, like the QE2 bridge um, or walking around during closures. And uh, it's, a, it's a real thrill to be able to contribute to um, the working of our overall infrastructure that's so important to people's daily lives. Uh, and that's, that's just a diagram about some of, the, some of the challenges we need to face and the real need for first principles behavior understanding to achieve that. So perhaps I'll just finish with a call to action. We need to embrace the environmental challenge of extending the life of bridges. Um, constraint drives innovation. We need to embrace that. We need to make the case, business case for clever solutions to difficult problems. And we need to promote the benefits of this really vital area of engineering. Thank you very much.